Thank you very much, Derek, for that introduction, and uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk about sudden death in sport, diagnosis, and prevention in athletes. The objectives of my talk are as follows. I will discuss the magnitude of the problem of causes of sudden death. I will provide a little bit of information about some of the diagnostic dilemmas we have to try to make a diagnosis. And then I will go on to discuss both primary and secondary preventative strategies to reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death during sport. But before I kick off uh, on a topic that sounds a little bit morbid, I should impress upon all of you that exercise is very good for us and that people who exercise regularly are less likely to be overweight, have a better blood pressure and lipid profile, and less likely to be diabetic. Indeed, by controlling all of these acquired risk factors for coronary artery disease, people who exercise modestly reduce the risk of a myocardial infarction by about 50% when they get to their 50s and 60s. Other than that, people who exercise live between three to seven years longer than those who don't exercise at all. Outside the cardiovascular system, we know that exercise improves confidence, stamina, it's an antidepressant, and it may retard the onset of dementia and reduce the risk of prostate cancer and colonic cancer. So there's nobody in this room who could argue that the best treatment we could ever prescribe our patients is exercise. It's free, it's devoid of side effects, and it can be performed at any time. And athletes are the epitome of health in any country. So, let's start talking about this issue. Every now and then, though, what does occur is that a young and apparently healthy individual does die suddenly. This is about 21 years ago. This young man is Hank Gathers, who was probably one of the best collegiate basketball players at the time. And everything's going very well at the moment. Number 44, lads just scored a basket. <coughs> and what you see now are our terrible scenes. A chap who's in ventricular fibrillation with cerebral hyperperfusion, uh, and again, he gets up, looks like a transient seizure, and just, he was, he's, been, he's been persuaded to try and get him for a stretcher. He's not keen, and he goes back down. And unfortunately, this chap lost his life that day. These deaths are clearly highly publicized by the media, who raise um, awareness about the youth of these people, the counterintuitive nature, and of course the, the number of life years lost. I'm pleased to report that sudden death in sport is actually rare, and it is age dependent. You've already heard, certainly in high school people, the incidence of sudden death in the United States is only a half per 100,000. As individuals get older, these are the athletes in their prime, it's about one in 50,000. If we look at middle-aged marathon runners, it's only a bit higher than that, about 2.2 per 100,000. But then when we start looking at the joggers with multiple risk factors in their 60s and 70s, that does go up to 13 per 100,000 because there's the added burden of age-related cardiovascular problems. I'm going to focus mainly on the young. Before I do that, the elderly, uh, the older athletes, they mainly die of coronary artery disease. But the young are the sort of people that interest us. They're the people that um, capture uh, our emotions when they die. The incidence of sudden death in young people, these are people under 35, is 1 in 50,000, and the mean age of death is around 23 years old, at the time when an athlete is at their prime. 40% occur in individuals aged under 18 years old, so high school age, and these deaths, for unexplained reasons, are far more common in males than females, with a 9 to 1 ratio. In fact, in recreational sportsmen, it's 20 to 1 male to female. 90% of deaths occur immediately or, or just during uh, exertion. And the sad thing is that around 80% have no warning symptoms before they die. By far the commonest causes of death in young people are the cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which you'll hear about later on, account for 40% of all deaths among young individuals. Based on Mary Shepard's series of 118 young individuals who died during exercise, we found that nearly a quarter have a structurally normal heart, where nothing is identified, and we believe that the vast majority of these individuals probably die from iron channel diseases, which you've heard about and will hear about later on, and possibly congenital accessory pathways. There are other things that cause deaths, uh, anomalous coronary arteries, anomalous origins, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia causing premature atherosclerotic coronary artery disease 
and the Marfan patient who makes a good basketball player but who can rupture or dissect their aorta. So I've told you briefly about the things that cause sudden death. Uh, now the diagnosis in these individuals is not so easy uh, and I'll talk about that in a, little bit, in a moment. But people who exercise and have got these conditions increase their risk of dying twofold compared to people who are sedentary. And that's because exercise is a trigger. If you think about a substrate like this, and you super add onto that all the stresses of exercise, such as acid-based disturbance, adrenergic surges, electrolyte imbalances, and dehydration, you can see that a vulnerable individual may go into ventricular fibrillation during intense exercise. Diagnosing athletes, as I've said, is difficult. And that's because People who exercise intensively do develop a unique set of structural and functional changes that permit the generation of a large cardiac output for prolonged periods. And these include, uh, and these are always mani manifest on the ECG and the echo. On the ECG, we see bradycardia, repolarization anomalies, voltage criteria for chamber enlargement. On the echocardiogram and MRI, we see big hearts, big cavities with slightly thickened walls and functional testing shows enhanced diastolic filling. And during exercise, we see augmentation of stroke volume, even during very rapid heart rates. This is what, uh, this is what an athlete's heart roughly looks like. There's about a 10% increase in LV and RV cavity size, and a 10 to 20% increase in left ventricular wall thickness. And the vast majority of athletes usually have wall thickness measurements that are within the normal range for people like you and I. However, the magnitude with, wi with which these electrical and structural changes manifest in an athlete is governed by several demographic factors, such as the age of the athlete, the sex, the type of sport, um, the ethnicity of the individual. And some athletes exhibit very large dimensions or repolarization changes that may overlap with a cardiomyopathy. Here's a bar chart showing you the distribution of over a thousand high-profile Italian athletes with the females in the red bars and the males in the blue bars. Uh, females have smaller dimensions than males. They're usually smaller, they've got less muscle bulk, and they, can usually, they can't usually exercise as hard as males. But what I want to point out to you is that 14% of athletes have an LV cavity of six centimeters or more, which would overlap with a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. Here's another slide looking at right ventricular outflow tract dimensions in athletes. Uh, uh, these, this, this is of different races, uh, white athletes in white bars, black athletes, by that I mean those of African or Afro-Caribbean uh, athletes in black bars. And if you look at the number of athletes fulfilling the major criteria for ARVC, we find that this is 28% of black athletes and 41% of white athletes have a right ventricular outflow tract diameter that overlaps with that required for a major criterion. Now, generally speaking, as sports cardiologists, we don't really worry about the size. It's not the size that matters, it's the function. And my wife's been telling me that for a long, long time. <laughs> but what we do worry about is a situation where we've got an athlete with a thickened left ventricular wall or an athlete with a very big cavity that seems to be contracting in a very lazy fashion. So we worry about left ventricular hypertrophy big cavities that appear to have suppressed ejection fractions, particularly when there, is co there are coexisting repolarization changes. And the sort of individuals that are affected that we worry about are the endurance athletes and athletes of Afro-Caribbean origin. These are the guys that give us our greatest diagnostic dilemmas because they've got very big hearts, they've often also got repolarization changes. And clearly here, the distinction between physiology and pathology is absolutely crucial because an erroneous diagnosis has very sinister consequences. For example, an erroneous diagnosis of athlete's heart in a young individual with cardiomyopathy could potentially jeopardize a life. Conversely, an er erroneous diagnosis of cardiomyopathy in a young person with athlete's heart destroys their career, which affects them physically, psychologically, and financially. So we've got to get it right. The black athletes are the ones that cause the biggest problem. Here are, is, is the usage of a Caucasian gold medalist rower, which shows sinus bradycardia and voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy in isolation. By that I mean there is no ST segment shift downwards or any T-wave inversion. Here's um, 
a, a, an ECG of an African marathon runner. And sure, they've got voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy, but what I want you to appreciate is that there is profound convex ST segment elevation in V1, V2, uh, sorry, in V2, V3, and V4, associated with asymmetric deep T wave inversion, which could overlap with an ARVC diagnosis. But this pattern that I'm showing you now is present in around 13% of Afro Caribbean athletes. Indeed, Afro -Caribbean, Afro Caribbean athletes also get thicker hearts. So if we look at uh, the combination of uh, these ECG changes in the infralateral leads plus a thick heart in an Afro Caribbean, then 5% of Afro Caribbean <laughs> athletes have ECG and echo features that overlap with morphologically mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If we compare the pattern of T-wave inversions in the anterior leads and the magnitude of the prevalence of RVOT tract dilatation, then 3% of black athletes have an ECG and echo that overlap with ARVC. This is tenfold greater than in Caucasian athletes. So one take home message is that if you're going to be assessing people, make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you've seen enough athletes. Make sure you know a lot about cardiomyopathy, especially when you're dealing with Afro-Caribbeans. Otherwise, you're onto an erroneous diagnosis, which could be costly for that young individual. I now want to move swiftly to the prevention of sudden cardiac death. I've just told you what causes deaths. In, in real life, we are really good at diagnosis, diagnosing cardiomyopathies and various other diseases in athletes. I just pointed out some of the diagnostic dilemmas. So we know what causes it. We know how to diagnose it, and there are various treatment strategies that may reduce the risk of sudden death, including lifestyle modification, beta blockers, radiofrequency ablation of accessory pathways, and even implantation of a cardioverter defibrillator. Clearly, a screening is a very controversial issue. There are several people that are against screening because sudden death in athletes is rare, one in 50,000. The disease is due to, the, the, the deaths are due to diverse pathology, ranging from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to ion channelopathies, and in many situations, we don't know what causes the death. Elaborate screening programs, certainly in the UK, would not be cost effective, and I'm not one that would argue with that. And of course, there is a risk of false positive tests. But you saw the video, these are highly visible events. They do capture the hearts of the nation in its entirety. These deaths are linked with sport. There is an association of numerous, uh, loss of numerous life years, and there are some acceptable interventions. So both the ESC and the AHA do believe that we should be doing something to identify young individuals at risk of sudden death. And there are two screening models. The American model relies on a health questionnaire and physical examination to ascertain symptoms suggestive of cardiovascular disease, such as chest tightness on exertion, breathlessness that's disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed, palpitation, uh, syncope, and of course, uh, a family history, and the physical examination looking for heart murmurs and the marfanoid habitus, as well as hypertension. The, it, the ESC model is uh, adopted via the Italians, and that uses a health questionnaire, physical examination, and a 12-lead ECG. And not surprisingly, the Italian model is better because it utilizes an additional test. One of the problems with the American model is it lacks sensitivity because 80% of athletes have no symptoms at all, so you'll miss 80% straight away. The ECG, as you've as I've already mentioned, is good at picking up electrical faults such as long QT, um, um, Brugada syndrome, WPW, and the ECG is abnormal in a large number of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and ARVC. Now, these ECG changes are not specific, but they are the first thing to raise suspicion of an underlying cardiomyopathy. In one large study performed by the Italians involving over almost 33,000 individuals, uh, they diagnosed 22 people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Three were de detected on the basis of a family history, 9% on the basis of a murmur, but a massive 73% uh, were detected only because an ECG is used. So the take home message here is that ECG is better than physical examination uh, and a health questionnaire in picking up people, not necessarily diagnosing them, but certainly picking up people who may have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Does screening prevent sudden deaths? Again, another controversial slide, and there are very many people that I know that would be jumping up and down if I showed this slide, but this is the best evidence we have so far. This is a prospective study. It's an Italian study where screening is mandatory, and it compares death rates in non-athletes that aren't screened in the yellow and death rates in, the, in athletes in the red. And this is a 25-year prospective study. And you'll see that at the start of this study, 
death rates in Italian athletes were 3.6 per 100,000. And as screening has gone on and on and on, uh, in about 2002, that death rate had gone down from 3.6 per 100,000 to 0.4 per 100,000, representing a 90% reduction in sudden death ever since the its inception of an ECG screening program. I should mention that we don't have an ECG screening program here in this country, a nationally sponsored one, but just to plug the charity that I'm the cardiologist for, the charity CRY do offer screening to all young individuals who are concerned, and they also are the main charity that tests the English Institute of Sport uh, the Football Association, the Rugby Union, and the Lawn Tennis Association. So there is a where to go sign if there are people that are worried about their health and, their, and, and various things. Many, many people, many elite sportsmen are, are tested all over the world. Unfortunately, this sort of service is not available for grassroots sports and school children who are much more likely to die than the elite sportsmen. If you look at the overall number, because there's more of them than the elite sportsmen. But there are concerns about this sort of screening program. Firstly, the incidence of sudden cardiac death is low. There are lots of false positives. There are concerns relating to false negatives. There's a cost issue and many other issues. Let's look at the prevalence of sudden death. Uh, the prevalence of sudden death is very low, one in 50,000. But if you actually tested thousands and thousands of young people with ECG and so forth, and these are studies coming from America, uh, from, uh, from Italy, from the Netherlands, lots of places, then the, the number of people that have actually got a condition that could potentially kill them is around one in 300. So if this is all about detecting people who may be at risk, then this is the data we should be using to decide whether we should be screening or not. Not the one in 50,000, because that's the person that's already dead, it's too late. It's the ones that may die that we should be testing. The number of false positives is a big issue. The ESC uh, basically devised um, criteria to differentiate between normal type 1 changes, which are typical of athletic training, and abnormal type 2 changes that require further investigation. This is laudable, but despite this, there are many, many false positive uh, um, rates, which range from 10% uh, and as high in some studies to 23%, which is clearly unacceptable. Now, why is this? Well, the first point is that the Italian data was derived uh, from an unselect athletic population. Large numbers, 35,000, but unselect, many of them entering athletic activity for the first time. So you can't really call them true athletes. And maybe this data should not be extrapolated to true athletes. Furthermore, they were confined to white athletes only. There was no data on black athletes. Let's look at the T-wave inversion. Just that would give black athletes a false positive rate of 25%. This is a black athlete's ECG, and based on that criteria, uh, so many black athletes would require further tests. Then we come to these very non-specific findings, left, left atrial enlargement, left axis deviation, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, which in isolation really don't mean anything and don't make any diagnoses, and they're present in 53%. The QT interval is very conservative at the ESC, 414 males, 416 females, that's too short for athletes. That would result in 59, in total 59% of people would be tested uh, uh, erroneously. The Seattle criteria has tried to improve things a little bit, but despite that, 50% of people would end up having tests for no reason, uh, uh, for, for these anomalies. So we devised our own findings based on lots of good data, which I'm not going to go into because I'm going to run out of time, but this is all evidence-based data, and we at St. George's use this criterion where we only test black athletes with two-wave inversion in V1 to V4, all athletes with left atrial enlargement alone, right atrial enlargement alone, right axis deviation, left axis deviation alone, or right ventricular hypertrophy. We only test them if they've got symptoms or a family history. Otherwise, we don't test them when we've got this in isolation. And based on that, the sensitivity for serious conditions was 100%. The specificity in Caucasians, 94%. Acceptable in Afro-Caribbeans, still a lot of work to do, 84%. What about false negatives? There are false negatives because of anomalous coronary arteries, which we won't pick up, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, incomplete expressions of cardiomyopathy, and of course acquired diseases such as commotia cordis and myocarditis, which will not be picked up through a screening program. So we need to do something else. We need defibrillators. Here's a study from uh, uh, France, which looked at a very large population of recreational athletes, dozen deaths in recreational athletes. They found that the mean age of death was 46.1, 93% were male. Their survival was only 15% in France. 
The death rate was only about two per 100,000, by the way. In, in the Netherlands, a similar study was performed. Mean age of these runners was 58.8, 95% were male, but their survival was 45%. So what's the difference between these two countries, 15% versus 45%? Well, this is the difference. There's the Netherlands versus France. Netherlands have got better survival rates. Why? Bystander witnessed arrest was the same, 89%, 94%. But bystander CPR was much greater in the Netherlands, 87% versus 31%. AED use was much greater in the Netherlands, 36% versus 1%. And what this tells you is that if, you, if you're going to be involved in managing sporting uh, uh, disciplines, you need to make sure that you've got your resuscitation protocols in place because resuscitation, certainly early resuscitation, reduces risk of sudden death. In fact, the French went back and looked at some of the regions where they did have good AED facilities. And when they looked specifically at those regions in France, their survival rates were 50%. With no data in the... These are older, middle-aged people. What about, what about young people? Very few data in young athletes. Here's one worrying study which looked at nine deaths mean age 21, all witnessed, all having early CPR. Despite that, eight out of nine athletes died. So survival rates didn't look very good in young people. And the authors argued that this may be because they all, a lot of them had HCM. And in many cases, the defibrillator was supplied by, uh, resus by emergency facilities, and there may have been more delays than they thought. And if we look at marathon runs, 10.9 million runs, uh, this is a big paper in, in uh, the New England. There were 59 deaths. I think their death rate was about 1 per 100,000. 29% survival rate. The factor that helped was CPR and use of AED. But I want you to look at the survivors versus the non-survivors. The survivors got early CPR. They got early defib. Um, but if you look at uh, the ones that died, look at that. Uh, the ones that died most... Most had 60, uh, 66, the, the ones that died, a large number had HCM, versus, versus the ones that survived, none of them had HCM. Suggesting that if you've got HCM, you need to be resuscitated in seconds, otherwise you're not going to make it. So it's all right saying we need defibs, but we need them fast. There, there is no time lag here. Uh, a school, school study, big school study, was very, very optimistic, so I want to leave you with optimistic messages. Uh, they looked at uh, 1,700 schools and they looked at uh, survival rates in school children and coaches. And they found if you had prompt CPR and AED shocks, uh, then your chance of surviving was 64%. The mean time to CPR was 1.5 minutes, and the mean time to um, shock was 3.6 minutes. But clearly, we need an emergency response plan, we need good personnel, we need a good communication system, we need location of an AED, we need to practice and review our emergency response plans. Just a very short video. I know I'm running out of time now, so I'm not going to stay long on this. But this is a situation that occurred a few years ago in France. And you can see an athlete not looking very well with agonal respiration. This is not a good sign. And you can see that there are emergency response services dealing with them, and certainly they're trying to protect his airway. A lot of commotion going on. No one's felt the pulse yet. And what you see here in slow motion is not a good sign. Let me tell you that this went on for six minutes before someone actually started CPR, by which time it was too late. But I'm pleased to say in the UK, things are much better in elite sports. This is what happened at my football club in 2012. And I think a couple of doctors involved in this success rate uh, are here. And this again, we're not showing you too much. But here's another athlete that goes about. Just look at the speed at which the doctors are on the, on the, on, on the side. It does still look a, a little bit scary. You see an athlete in real trouble here. And, and something else that comes out here, these guys are strong. We're rolling them over and all sorts of things. It's not easy. Especially we've got 40,000 people chanting away as well. But what I want to show you all is that the doctors are ready. They've realised there's something really seriously wrong. You see the gloves, the, uh, the airway stuff coming out. You see people communicating. Even though these guys were... They said they were never going to be as prepared when this happened. 
But what I want to, without showing too much, was CPR was started just over a minute later, and this guy was shocked and made a very good recovery. So if you can resuscitate, if you're not, if you're not going to screen, we should have AEDs in place. Well, if you're going to have AEDs in place, we need good personnel, we need to act very, very quickly. And these are the survival rates, certainly uh, throughout. Look at the London Marathon survival rate, not bad, at 43%. Schools with AEDs, 64%. So in conclusion, sudden death in young athletes is rare. Exercise is a trigger for sudden death in predisposed athletes. The diagnosis of cardiac pathology is challenging in some individuals. Screening with ECG identifies athletes with cardiomyopathy. Early CPR and AEDs save lives if we're not going to screen. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>